Tenakoto Tefano, O Aotearoa Unitarians. Tenakoto na manhiri, no mai, hire mai. Ki tene hui topa a te atoa, tenakoto tenatato katoa. Well, welcome once again to our virtual sanctuary. In case you haven't noticed, uh, this is a uh, often a stressful time of year, every year. But in a pandemic, it is magnified many times over. Tempers sometimes get worn thin. Per, so I thought perhaps it'd be worthwhile to simply reflect on anger so it does not take control of who we are. So that will be our theme today. And I've lost my candle. Hang on. I'm back. If you have a candle or a chalice, this would be the time to light it. For this one hour, Spirit of Life, we let go. For this one hour, may we let go of our anxieties, our fears, our anger, our self-doubts, our regrets, our petty grievances, and our distractions. If only for this one hour, let the flame of this chalice burn them from our hearts and minds and light our way to peace and serenity for this one holy hour. For our opening song, I've chosen a, one that uh, captures some of the challenges of the time. And in the spirit of that, my reading this morning is a lament. I will introduce my musings this morning with a lament. I begin this sermon naming the aches, pains, heartaches, sorrows, fears. Let us allow ourselves to acknowledge the hurting places. Those whose homes do not feel safe and cannot get enough food. Those who struggle to care for their children and their elders safely. The longing of a child to have playmates. We hear the loss of those who had hoped to be a, a graduate to be in a graduation ceremony, hope to watch the, the birth, hope to share in the rites of passage. We hear the lament of longing to hug, to hold, to touch, to whisper in an ear. We know the emptiness of loneliness, how vast, how deep. We hear the lament of wondering when sickness and death will come, wondering if we will be ready. We acknowledge the burden of guilt, of wondering if one may have infected another, whether this guilt makes sense or not. We grieve that those who are not grieving cannot gather together. There is a strain of blame when others, when another passes too closely, feels too careless. We hear the anger of those who work hard and wish others would stay home. We hear the anger of those who fear for their livelihood and families by staying home. The longing of those who wish to work, to make a difference, to lend a hand, to be of use. We fear because we know that fear can make a people weak to division and blame. And we hear the ancient cry of those who feel on the margins and wonder if they are included. The anger that yet, the anger that yet again, having less meaning, that one has less 
when misfortune hits us all. That trying to get ahead is harder for those who are already behind. The ancient striving of those with resources to give enough to be generous in the ways that truly make us a whole society, not just parts of society. Wondering when this will end and what will come and what will the end look like? Will there be a time of ease again, a time of comfort? These are the laments, the sorrowful wails, the quiet anguish of humans throughout history when they have faced the plague. I struggled to find the right music for this moment, but decided to go back to my past. I must have been about 14 when I first heard uh, Bob Dylan sing The Times They Are A-Changing. But I listened to it again, and there were a lot of things in it that seem to apply to today. So you're all on mute, and I'm going to play the lyrics as he sings, and you can sing along. I'm sure you probably already know the lyrics. This week I've mused on the issue of anger and a thought that came to me that what are one of the things that fuel anger? And it occurred to me that the answer is privilege. So that's my musing topic. In a recent opinion piece that engaged me, Kevin Norquay wrote in Stuff, not long ago, I made someone very angry. So angry that spit was flying out of his mouth where it clung to his mustache and white blobs. So angry his face turned deep crimson. So angry, his hand signals resembled Tyson Fury punches. Lucky for me, he was in his ute and I was in my car, protruding out of a side street where its nose had absorbed about two meters of his road. Indefensible, really as Mr. Spittle communicated in his rage. Later, he probably mentioned my idiocy to his mates. He probably still thinks of me from time to time and clenches his feet, fists. But was his anger appropriate for the level of inconvenience, given he was on his way in 10 seconds? Right now, parts of New Zealand are like Mr. Spittle. Rage is rampant, anxiety abounding, mere mention of words such as vaccine, mandate, MIQ, Mori, Aotearoa, lockdown, three waters, and Jacinda can set up a tax spitting frenzy. In 2021, New Zealand is beset with more problems than a T's intersection standoff. Let's not list them here. Let's try to get through at least one story without the word COVID in it. Oh, bugger, sorry. We, we don't want divisions to rip us apart, yet that appears to be happening. It's as if the happier pre-pandemic days plastered over a deep unease, if the word unease is strong enough. Trump banners at New Zealand protests don't vote well for a united country. With Trump's USA built on disdain for experts and politicians, the very ones trying to outline a Kiwi path out of the pandemic. Protesters have congregated on parliament grounds in Wellington, outside the Beehive. We have protesters with a range of grievances they wish to be heard, some worthy. Inside, we have a prime minister who sees little merit in emerging to hear them after being yelled at 
up and down the country for weeks. Some recent social media feeds have been frankly terrifying, saying Jacinda would be lynched if she went to Auckland. When even doctors have been threatened at gunpoint, nothing can be ruled out, nothing. Anger, fear, and anxiety are grinding down God's own. Even if some of those outside Parliament did not reflect the vast bulk of New Zealanders, some did. They are part of a long list of those who allege their views are being ignored, business owners, farmers, nurses, teachers, for starters. Protests are a perfectly valid and important way of expressing upset and level of annoyance, of indicating anxiety and demanding change provided they don't get violent. Storm government buildings and cause death as they did in Washington, D.C. What is not fine is letting anger run amok so that family, friends, or innocent others suffer. Biting a police officer has happened in Northland this week as a case in point. Biting is an act more commonly administered by a frightened animal. Retail workers, medical professionals, epidemiologists, police, politicians, media figures who have encouraged vaccination, veterinarians and librarians even, have reported a heightened level of, of abuse as the future looks increasingly uncertain. All professions on that list have a desire to help the public to try to make New Zealand a better place. Yes, even journalists. Mass anxiety and its related bad behaviors are hurting the helpers. Based on experience, asking people to try to be nicer, to try to control their emotions, to try to talk to those with views that differ, is to invite vitriol and personal attack. Apparently, not much has changed over the past 2,000 years. In ancient Greece, in Athens, there was a great plague in 430 BC. A person named Thucydides survived and recorded his observations. Catherine Kaleidas, a scholar of ancient Greece, observes Thucydides and his contemporaries did not believe that we are born good. We become good by choosing to do good. We become brave by choosing courage. We become the twin vices. We overcome the twin vices of self-interest and fear by actively rejecting them. She tells us that he saw the plague the way people behaved, in the way people behaved. For the violence, the Thucydides now, for the violence of the calamity was such that men not knowing where to turn grew reckless of all law, human and divine. And men who had hitherto concealed what they took pleasure in now grew bolder. Her observations caused me to muse on anger and how much of it is fueled by privilege. We all get angry. If we don't think so, we should schedule some time with a therapist. Everyone has felt antagonisms towards someone or something we feel has deliberately done us wrong. Anger can be a good thing. It can give us a way to express negative feelings, for example, or motivate us to find solutions to problems. But excessive anger can cause problems, increased blood pressure and other physical changes associated with anger make it difficult to think straight and harm our physical and mental health. And anger can divide a community or country. Lots of things can evoke it. Some of my anger embarrasses me. 
This is when I've done something I consider particularly stupid. Sometimes it is at someone who has humiliated me or said hurtful things. And even then my anger is also at myself for giving them the power to undermine my self-worth. Then there is anger at injustice. When I have been unjustly treated, I know it immediately. Not so much when others have been. It's hard not to notice that a large proportion of the people I've seen on the news angrily marching and protesting vaccine man mandates or having a vaccine at all are male and white. They have a strong sense of injustice when rules don't favor them. In one psychological study of white privilege, the, re the researchers were taken on a visit to a slaving fort in Ghana. They were shown the original church on the property. At the entrance of the church was an opening that looked down into a pit that had held slaves. So the faithful could survey their property as they entered and exited church services. This raises a question. What did the parishioners tell themselves? as they sat in pews above recently enslaved human beings. Today, we can marvel at the mental work necessary to literally walk over souls on the way to saving your own. But even in Aotearoa, we still live in a society that bestows vast privileges on Pakeha that separate them from Maori and ethnic minorities. Compared with their Maori counterparts, Pakeha on average have vastly more wealth. This started with land theft and has continued through institutional racism and through inequitable education, health, and justice systems designed by and for Pakeha. Yet today, many Pakeha, the ones who call talk, talk back radio, believe that ethnic minorities enjoy racial privileges. This is easily ignited tender for anger. For as Latin American actor Stephanie Herrera once observed, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality can feel like oppression. Let me read that again. When you're accustomed to privilege, equality can feel like oppression. Lauren Curry, uh, an officer of the British Empire, observed that white privilege doesn't mean your life hasn't been hard. It means your skin tone isn't one of the things making it harder. There are plenty of other privileges, socioeconomic, male, heterosexual, able-bodied, but white privilege is perhaps the most enduring throughout all of history. For most of us, our recent outrage due to the stress of a pandemic is a privilege. Today, I'm writing you to pause. Today, I'm inviting you to pause and ask yourself, where does my anger come from? If you're like me, it's likely to be from a place of relatively safe middle-class privilege. Ask yourself, who else is suffering? Who's been suffering this whole time? And I didn't notice. How does this affect them? Perhaps by shifting our focus, to them, our own anger will dissipate, swallowed up by our love, care, and kindness for them. Even Mr. Spittle, as Thucydides observed, it's a choice to do so, but a good one. Good for ourselves, 
good for others, good for the country. Who knows? We might even let a car move out into traffic from a side street. I want to, for a meditation, offer this one by Stephen Schick called Useful Anger. It begins with a quote by Marge Piercy. A good anger swallowed clots of blood to slime. He goes on to say, but what is to be done with it? This anger that dare not be swallowed, should it be diluted with denial, cooled with indifference? Should it be sweetened with good intentions, softened with lies? Should it be spewed out red hot over searing tongues? scorching the guilty and innocent alike. What's to be done with it? This anger that dare not be swallowed. Don't dilute it, deny it, or cool it. Don't sweeten it or soften it. But pause for a moment. Could you hold it before your eyes? Examine it with your heart and mind? Could you hold it, then touch it to your belly that place where your soul rests? Could you let it enter there knowing it is part of you that needs to be treated kindly, that needs to be listened to, that needs to be honored? For it has the power to save you, to save us all. And now I'll offer our closing hymn. It's one of our Unitarian hymns, hymn 34. These are my closing words, and they're by Lindy Ramston, entitled Beatitudes for Justice Builders. Blessed are you who can question your own assumptions and listen with an open mind. You will receive new insights beyond your imagining. Blessed are you who suffer the attacks of others to stand up for what is right. You will not be alone for your courage will inspire others to rise. Blessed are you who build friendships as well as justice. Even when you lose an issue, you will have strengthened the foundation of your community. Blessed are you who take delight in people. You will not be bored at, in meetings. Blessed are you who agitate the placid waters of complacency. You will create waves in the inertia of privilege and will know the thrill of riding the surf of change. Blessed are you who lead with enthusiasm and confidence, resisting the temptation to share the apathetic or self-absorbed. You will inspire curiosity and hope in others. Blessed are you who play as well as work. You will have more fun build more energy, and will draw the powers of the impish to your cause. Blessed are you who ask for help in your role as leaders. You will find teachers at every turn, and your work will remain interesting and alive. Blessed are you who, when wrongfully attacked, find safe outlets for your righteous rage. Your mind will be clear your decisions strategic, and your progress will not be derailed by the backlash of the fearful. Blessed are you who do not demonize your opponents. Your heart and your eyes will be open. Blessed are you who sing and dance. You will find energy and joy to lift you on your journey. Blessed are you who Offer thanks and praise fivefold for every critique. Your children will want to visit after they are grown. People will want to serve on your committees and friends will be interested in your opinion. 
Blessed are you who study the rhythms of history. You will have knowledge with which to shape the future. Blessed are you who work in coalition rather than principled isolation. You will meet great people, learn things you didn't realize you needed to know, and have partners for the journey when you are in the lead or in need. Blessed are you who volunteer to be secretary and take good minutes. Your words will become history and your efforts will move steadily forward rather than running absent-mindedly over thoroughly discussed ground. Blessed are you who discover, train, and encourage young leaders. You will see your work expand and grow beyond your own time and talent. Blessed are you who can change your mind. You are still alive. Blessed are you who will not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You will see progress in your lifetime. If you are an active spirit, blessed are you with an active spiritual life. You will find perspective and comfort in times of loss and betrayal and will rise without cynicism to meet the challenges of a new day. And lastly, blessed are you who live from a place of gratitude, for you will know the meaning of life. And now it's time to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Okay, well, it's time for you to uh, have a chat with each other. Um, and you won't be surprised by my questions. Where does your anger most often come from? How does it blind you? And how could you use it for good? Where does it come from? How does it blind you? How can you use it for good? 